Hi there and welcome to Point of View. I'm Mark Leishman and it's a welcome return to Alison Jews. Well, to recap, Alison's a fourth generation farmer. She's farmed in both New Zealand and Australia for 25 years. Trained at Massey, practices a large animal vet through the Waikato and Bay of Plenty and has gained a Master's in Science studying freshwater ecology policy and nutrient management and we're delighted to have her back with us. Currently she's working with Tipper Whenua Consultancy, which is your own business. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Nice to see you again, Alison. Tell us about Tipa Whenua. Um, our focus is really around helping farmers adapt to change and farming inside limits and um, One World, One Health is our theme, which is really focusing on the fact that we've only got one environment and as vets we work at the intersection of the environment, animals and people. So it's working in collaboration with the medical profession on public health issues, um, also regional councils on mm. sort of how environmental limits are managed, but also the focus is working with farmers and helping them adapt to change in sustainable ways. How amenable are farmers to what you have to say? Is it always positive or is it hard for them to take it? Look, this is a really tense space, the mm. intersection of um, farming, mm. the environment and people and perceptions. And there's a demographic profile out there. The leaders are very amenable, mm. amenable and they're the people that we tend to work with. But mm. there's also the average has got to move ahead as well with the times and times are changing fast. So there's always going to be tension across that profile mm. of, of the farming group. I detect though that, th that farmers are sort of realising that things have got to change. We've got to do better. Um, even to sell our products overseas, uh, overseas are looking at us to see how we do it. So, do you do you detect that uh, farmers are getting more into this and thinking, oh, "I've got to learn." Absolutely. You know, I just keep meeting great farmers, and they're thinking outside the square, and they're going, "We are not enjoying this rural urban tension," and it's mm. a big thing in New Zealand. And the leaders are really trying to think their way out of this to the point that actually I'm getting the feeling that, that the leading thinkers are saying, look, I'm not sure that the compliance standards set by the regional councils are going to be enough for me. I want to step ahead of that. I want to be a bit more innovative. I want to add value. I want to show that I've got legitimate things happening on my farm that are beyond compliance and I want to tell a story about them. So. They're the people that I'm really excited about working with. And how many of them? Are there enough of them to, to, to you know, have a sea change, if you like, in attitude? Look, this is moving fast, the space, and there are farmers like that, thinking like that, right across the country. They're just sort of bedding down, understanding what the rules mean, what it means to have an overseer operating on their farm, what it means to maybe drop their nutrients by 50%, etc. So this adapting to this new world is just happening mm. but right across the country I'm, I'm so fortunate to be mixing with leading thinkers and amongst that are agribusiness people, the vets working with groups of farmers mm. and these um, farmers are getting on board to say look how can we demonstrate to the consumer that we've, we're doing things differently, better and beyond compliance. Mm. That doesn't mean to say they're going to set a standard that's way ahead mm. of anyone else, but at least because you don't get change until you get tension. Mm. Right at the moment we've got tension, and as a result of that we get a bit of chaos, we get a public discourse, which I think we're going to get a very hot public discourse mm. this year, but out of that, that disruption creates an opportunity for change, and that's a space that I'm lucky to be working in with some great people and great thinkers. Mm. Are they the best farmers, the ones who are acknowledging this, do you think? Are they the ones that you really have a respect for, not only for this, but are they the ones who, the most successful ones, the ones who are following this, are, are into it? It's hard to say who's better than anyone else. They're different. Mm. So they're, they're say best, I suppose, most successful. I suppose. Early adopters. Mm. And look, in, in farming and in markets and commodity production, etc., early adopters always are light on their feet. They mm. think ahead. They think about how their farm system wants to look in 10 years. Mm. And they're, they're the sort of ones that, and, and you asked me, are they, where are they in New Zealand? They're right across the country. Mm. And I like to think of New Zealand almost as if it's got 
all these little lights starting to shine right across, mm -hmm. right down to Southland, right up from Northland, and they're popping up. And so is it enough for a sea change? I think when enough lights come on across the country with a good enough media, with good enough stories getting out there to socialise it, both the urban and, and into the rural um, people, mm. I, I, I do believe that there will be quite a rapid sea change. Mm. Now, you know, we mentioned the tension, there's tension this week, of course, with uh, Greenpeace dropping off a whole carton loads or container loads of sewage outside the ACC building, um, re Ruatanifa. Um, what are your thoughts on the Ruatanifa, the momentum, which seems to have gained a little traction last week uh, with, you know, the, the getting enough farmers uh, contracted? Do you agree? Are you happy with the Ruatanifa? Do you think it's a good idea? I was involved with the Ruatanifa decision and process with the EPA in 2011-2012, so it's been really interesting watching that pro process. There's a lot of public awareness emerging around it and possibly around how water is used when it's dammed and I think the public's understanding that a lot of the water from these larger dams where they cost to build the dams has to go to things like dairy or dairy support mm. and there is resistance to that because of also the understood effects of a large amount of dairy in a catchment occurring. It's not about any individual farmer but it's about the cumulative mm. effect of say 40 or 50 percent of an area turning into dairy and I think that's where the resistance is. Mm. But if you, um, with what happened last week, I don't think we're still clear on the transparency around all those farmers signing up. So I think there's still a little bit more water to go under the bridge there, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So I'm yeah. not sure if it's a signed, sealed, delivered deal quite just yet. yet. Quite yet. Of course, a lot of it in Hawke's Bay has been talked about is, is the horticulture side, you know, the pit fruit growing and things like that, a lot of the water going in that direction. Absolutely, yeah. and that's a really good thing to chat about because... Mm -hmm. You know, in reality, with these dams and the allocated water for the areas, often it is only about 2 or 3 or 4% of the area that goes to horticulture. And yet that is probably the place that you get the best bang for the buck with the money. So, you know, horticulture with drip feed irrigation, precision systems, generates high profit for the use of the water. Whereas our pastoral systems, which you know, amongst the discussion here, they'll often take up to twice the amount of water and the profit per um, amount or unit of resource use isn't going to be the same. So this is the discussion point we're moving to in public discussion mm. and certainly maybe around, you know, future discussion around price on water like they have in Australia. Well, that's an interesting point because there's been a lot of uh, talk, a lot of headlines about the Chinese uh, company that has been taking our water for, for nothing and then selling it on and making millions of dollars in profit, which just seems offensive really to most of us. Mm. But we don't charge for water unless you're in the city. Um, dairy farmers don't get charged for water. The, if we were to be, that would be a huge block for dairy farmers, wouldn't it? A, a huge uh, amount of money to overcome. Well, it depends on the price and yeah. it depends on where New Zealand goes with this. So, so do you have an example of a country, I mean Australia, do they charge for their water? Absolutely. So if we can just touch on the Australian situation, because I was there between 1995 and 2010, and that was pretty much the period that they bought in water pricing. So the Murray River, which effectively starts up in the Snowies in uh, um, New South Wales, then makes its way down through northern Victoria, where a lot of water was getting taken out for irrigation, mm -hmm. and then wanders through South, South Australia to... Um, Adelaide where they were running out of water and actually looking at having to um, put in a desalination plant for the municipal or mm. town city requirements. So great tensions there mm. and, and so in 1994 they decided to put a cap on further water takes and Australia's gone through effectively, what are we now, you know, a 23 year process mm. to now have a situation where water has been unbundled from the land title there's a price on water, there's been an active water trading market. Um, so if we think about from 1994, what precipitated it was this type of tension and discourse mm -hmm. that we're getting in New Zealand right oh, now. Yeah. So we might be embarking on the same pathway. The Australian situation is probably world class in how they're managing this situation now. But um, water is now allocated with and capped 
in, in the environment requirement, environmental requirements mm. are basically what set the, the, the bottom line and then over and above that then you've got um, either low security or high security water which is then able to be used following the environment's requirements being met. So I was in Australia in the drought 2006-2007, this really moved this conversation on fast because mm. the Murray, Murray got really under stress. Um, they, they, the government was buying back water from the Murray to, to meet environmental flows mm -hmm. and the pricing and the structure and the trading became quite well established. Now it's very well established. Mm -hmm. um, price on water, farmers have a high security or low security water. They have entitlements which might be to the tune of two to three thousand dollars a megalitre for the entitlement. Mm -hmm but then an annual use charge as well, which is getting around $200 to $300 per megalitre. So they start making some serious choices mm -hmm. about how they use that water and what they do it for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we could be moving on that same trajectory in New Zealand. So you're looking at, I mean, roughly in Australia, it's two cents per litre of water. Yeah, around that, yeah. And it's, the, it's different yeah. with different security waters and different places and where it's used, and of course, a horticultural user with precision systems, etc., with high profit being mm. generated from that water, can afford to pay a lot more. Right, vineyards are included in that sort of thing. Absolutely, yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's intriguing, isn't it? So you, you can almost guarantee that that is inevitably going to happen here. Something like that, isn't it? Well, I don't think we can carry on with the tension we've got right no. at the moment. Exactly. Mm. My special guest, uh, enjoying her company immensely, is uh, Alison Jews, and we're talking lots of water, uh, very much of issue uh, these days, a uh, lot of tension, and we'll have more from Alison right after this break. You're watching Point of View on Country TV. Welcome back, this is Point of View, I'm Mark Leishman, my guest is Alison Jews. Now we talked about uh, the potential to, you know, start charging for water. Um, what will happen to the money raised from charging that? Where does it go? <laughs> well that's another really good question because New Zealand um, uh, hasn't really ventured into that conversation. But, I mean, one could argue that something along the lines of a national organisation or commission that is paid to that, the, the charge on water. The Australian situation is a, I can't remember quite the name, but a national environmental management group which receives a large amount of the funds and then that's re-administered. Mm. So in New Zealand, yes, something along those lines that's overseen by a mix of people, including iwi as stewards, um, these are just my ideas, but to also look to, for that money to go back into repairing and replenishing the environment where we've had significant degradation. Because at the moment, I think um, nationally, there's around 500 million and even more being spent on cleanup funds like Lake Ellesmere and mm -hmm. different areas around the country. So there's an argument that yes, if there's a charge, there should be money go back to clean up and replenish some of the damage that has been done mm. where we haven't been quite so careful with intensification and vulnerable areas. Hawke's Bay is an example, you know, with the Ruatanifa, not a big dairy area, but of course once the water becomes available, do you suspect that it will become a much bigger dairy area or will horticulture retain its strength? Well, that's a really good question because with these big dams, and they cost a significant amount of money to build, or 300 million mm. or what might be even four or even more 100 million now because it's changing, mm. um, there's a price on the water and I understand that's around 27 cents or 26 cents a cubic metre. It's got to be workable for dairy at a long-term average milk price of four to five dollars. So there's a challenge there because um, you're looking at around thousand dollars a hectare to irrigate dairy with that water at that price mm. and I personally don't think it stacks up at a four dollar fifty five dollar milk price so economics will largely drive mm. what comes out of that but the challenge with these big dams is that they do rely on a lot of pastoral use to use that water because it's a significant portion of the water that needs to be bought on a regular basis 
So on the Rotanifer, for example, it was relying on about 37% of the area being dairy. And then, of course, with every, every dairy area, we've got the dairy support area. So that adds on another half a hectare for every hectare of milking area. So you're potentially looking at maybe 60% of that area at least mm -hmm. being pasture and using that water. So the numbers have got to stack for these things to go ahead. Are you, I mean, are you a fan of Ruatanafa? Do you think damming is the, is the answer, rather than letting the water go to the sea, that we're actually holding it and using it when we need it? I'm a big fan of doing the right thing with the right land and making the right choices and using our resources really efficiently. So um, I think it's going to be challenging in Ruatanafa to, to have all that water go to pastoral uses. I th I'm in favour of horticulture using the water and high value agriculture with precision systems but I'm not sure that we've got a lot of that at the moment. Um, high uh, value seed crops, arable, yes absolutely but we've got to be able to demonstrate a good profit from that price or that resource used and I'm not sure when it's 27 cents a cubic metre in Ruatanifal or 26 or thereabouts, mm. we don't quite know that final resting place. Um, if at a four dollar fifty to five dollar milk mm. price long term, it's going to stack. So I still come back to the economics have to be there long term, and we have to be looking after and working within the environmental limits as well. And that's another point is that the Tuki Tuki River, the limits put in there for nitrogen because this all links up. It's one big picture. <coughs> um, was set at um, point eight. Um, so that's a tenth, or almost a tenth, of the bottom lines that are being set in Can Canterbury. Not quite, just probably more about, um, there's about an eightfold difference. So mm. the government's got national objectives framework and bottom line limits that are being going to be agreed to this year as well as part of this big discussion on water quality. So it's going to be interesting to see where that final resting place is as well for nitrogen concentration in rivers because I think that'll influence things to a degree as well. As well. Um, you mentioned before in the first part of our program, Overseer, um, is this going well? Are you, you know, agreeing with, with its use and its development? So Overseer is the farm's um, model that identifies, I suppose, the degree of risk from any sort of farming system in terms of nitrogen coming out. So. And look, it's all we've got at the moment. Um, it's not validated or calibrated for large areas of soils where we're currently intensifying. So mm. Canterbury, 70% of those soils are coarse soils where the intensification and things like Central Plains water and new irrigation schemes are being proposed, mm. but we haven't actually got it properly validated for a lot of those soil areas, which to me is a concern. It's like driving a Ferrari flat out with, with no speedometer working, and mm. I don't think we can keep doing that. We've got to invest in it. it so with the, with the soils, what, what, what's the issue there with the water and the, the soil not being Okay, so, so a lot of the Canterbury soils are coarse, leaky, sandy, gravelly. So water disappears. Yeah. So water goes through them really fast. They don't have good water holding capacity. They actually require a lot of water. Mm. So around Is it five... that riverbed type? Yes, land? yeah, and it takes a while to build up organic matter. So they need about 550 mils to 620 mils per hectare per year to grow pasture right through to satisfy an intensive dairy system requirement. The issue with it is that we have to also put a lot of nitrogen on those areas. Mm. It leaks through, it runs through those soil profiles. We don't have a good handle on what it's doing to the aquifers. Mm. Although we do know that areas that have been farmed for a long time, like around Ashburton with intensive systems, have now got the, the shallow aquifers showing concentrations of 5 um, to 11 um, parts per million of nitrate in them, which is unsatisfactory for um, mm. some forms of consumption. So we're putting more stress on drinking water systems mm. to clean things up. And this is where we come back to the one world, one health. We need to think about how we use our landscapes, mm. how it impacts on long-term um, receiving environments, but also on public health. Mm. So it all joins up. Of course, the problem is that every area is probably different, has its own unique, uh, you know, attributes that need to be considered. 
that, that's exactly right. And some, and, and so when you say the unique attributes, that's like the biophysical or, or the strengths and weaknesses. So Waikato and Taranaki have always been long-term sound, safe farming areas because of the soil types, because of the climate. They haven't required a lot of extra inputs and they've actually been able to farm quite nicely um, in those areas and they've been long-term sound and safe. But as we push for more commodity to come out of this country, um, we have been pushing into more vulnerable, risky areas and we're seeing effects within 15 to 20 years. And I think that's probably the tension that's coming out of Canterbury at the moment. Within 15 years, we're seeing quite significant degradation in rivers. We've now got tourism as our main earner. We've got tourism and farming locking horns. Mm. We've got to get over this. We've got to lock hearts, not horns. And that'll mean that we've got to farm within these environmental limits and probably our rivers will still have to be swimmable or mm. get swimmable. Wow. <laughs> Challenging <laughs> stuff. Nice. And accordingly, you were involved in the National Environment Group for Landcorp. Uh, they've got lots of properties uh, in the South Island as well. I mean, what is your role there? So Landcorp set up a national environmental reference group of um, a group of quite outspoken people. Um, and Good meetings. Credit, <laughs> absolute credit to Landcorp and um, Steve Cardin for, for pushing for this because... I, I honestly think they're leading the way in the fact that they're willing to have confronting discussions and you can be sure we have confronting <laughs> discussions but it's great because Landcorp is really making some progress on its thinking here. Um, it's, it's listening to the issues openly and um, look I, I can't speak for them but I've been very impressed with the approach and I think it's probably an example of the type of approach we have to take take on board a lot quicker and a lot more openly right across New Zealand. So do you have to put a flak jacket on when you go to a board meeting then? <laughs> no, they're great people, they're open-minded, they can see where this has got to go, they understand that this will take time, but, uh, and farm systems take a long time to change too, mm. but they're looking for the opportunities um, and also I think very conscious as well of the rural urban divide and challenge and if we can start getting the part of this lighthouse effect that I'm talking about across the country, yeah. if we get clusters of farmers, innovators, thinkers and demonstrators like what Landcorp's proposing to do, this is just a great start for New Zealand to start turning the corner. Mm. Um, the, the, the Vet Association, and you're on the board there too in your very, very busy life. What are the big issues there? Again, obviously I suppose animal welfare to a degree, but... Uh... Absolutely. I mean, the, the veterinary profession, like all professions and agriculture, is going through transition as well. And our focus is on things like well-being, which is all part of this one world, one health type thinking, where we know we operate as vets at the intersection of animals and the environment and people, and everything's intimately connected, mm -hmm. and that... Um, we, we think long term too and I, th I think uh, an example of that is quite recently, last, um, la late last year when the Veterinary uh, Association came out with their vision for 2030 to have a far less reliance on antibiotics because as we know agriculture globally uses around 60% of and even potentially 70% of all antibiotics produced. Now we know that by 2030 Public health is going to be the main concern and antibiotics will have to be spared and looked after um, for, for human health. So if that's the case, agriculture will have to re reduce its reliance on it mm -hmm. as a preventative measure. So we're thinking as a profession about where things are going in the next 15 to 20 years and farming within limits is also part of it. And what are the alternatives to antibiotics? Well-being. Health, mm -hmm. optimising um, your environment, the way you live, and that's for an animal, or you and I are both animals, mm -hmm. so we can all talk about the same thing. But, yeah. you know, it it's really comes it. <laughs> it comes down to making sure you've got optimal health. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we know that's mental health as well. Um, we know it's, it's just how we manage ourselves. And it's no different for our farming systems. Mm -hmm. We've got to look at providing things so that our animals are, are well, and that means shelter, it means it means food when they need it, it means 
keeping stresses and challenges out of it, so actually preventing disease, almost um, breeding to avoid disease or picking up disease at really early mm -hmm. points. So there's a whole lot of management streams there mm -hmm. that we can do so that we're not treating things at the bottom of the cliff. Mm -hmm. And so our approach is we've got to start thinking about prevention a whole lot more, optimising health and wellbeing. It's no different for people. Well, thank you so much. It's uh, I loved having a chat with you. Special guest Alison Dews from the Tip of Whenua Consultancy. And the great water debate will continue, flowing like the water does into the sea. Well, that's our programme. Thank you so much for joining us. Point of View will be back with another Point of View next week. We'll see you then. Mm -hmm.